Well, this morning, um, we are going to be tackling the topic of dealing with, with doubt. And I think if we're honest uh, with ourselves, I think we all have, have times, we have moments in our lives where we, where we struggle with doubts, where we struggle maybe with um, what God is doing in our lives or where we struggle with God's plan. Sometimes life is, is just hard. Uh, sometimes God places burdens on our lives that almost feel like they are just, just simply too much uh, to bear. And in those moments, we, we sometimes kind of have this feeling as if, uh, as if God has somehow lost sight of us. And the Bible teaches us that we're not alone in feeling that way. I want to read with you just a, a short story from the Gospel of Mark. From the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 35, a familiar story about the disciples of Jesus. We read, on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, that's Jesus saying to his disciples, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he, that is Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea. Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? What's interesting about this story is that the disciples were doing exactly what Jesus had said. The disciples were being faithful, and yet they end up in, in this horrific storm. And what's worse is that as they look, Jesus is, is kind of asleep at the wheel. And so, and so they, they, they wake him up and they say, Jesus, don't you care? Don't, don't you see what's happening to us? And I wonder if those words have ever been your words. Or you've ever said, God, don't you, don't you care? God, don't you see what's happening to us? I think we often forget that even faithful disciples encounter storms. And the question that God is after is the question of who will you trust? In the storm, and that's really the heart of our passage today. Let me offer just a, a short prayer uh, as we open up God's Word, and then we'll read from Exodus chapter uh, five today. Oh God, your Word is more precious than fine gold and sweeter than purest honey. As we turn to your Scriptures. Send your Holy Spirit to infuse your word with truth and grace so that the good news of your love would shine before our eyes and delight our senses so that we cannot help but respond to your word with wonder, with faith, and with trust. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, I want to read with you from Exodus 5. We're going to carry on where we left off last time. Exodus 5, it's going to be the verses 15 just through to chapter 6, verse 1. We have to remember that sometimes when we look at our, our English translations, we see these, these chapter breaks. Um, that wouldn't have been the case in the original Hebrew. This is kind of one story that flows along, and so I'm just reading a, a, a portion of that story. There we read, Then the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants. Yet they say to us, make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten. But the fault is in your own people. But he said, you are idle. You are idle. That is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. 
No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily tasks each day. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh and they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. So far, the reading of God's holy word. Well, I'm so thankful this morning to be able to continue our sermon series uh, through the book of of Exodus. And I, I have to admit that I am especially thankful to be able to do that in person. Uh, praise God for that. Amen. It's hard for me to imagine that this is actually only my my third time uh, preaching to the church family here at Fellowship in person. Um, things have certainly not gone according uh, to plan. And I think, I think that has been hard, and it's been, um, it's been hard for me personally as well. I have um, I've struggled with, with how to lead well um, during this past season. And I've struggled with what it looks like to be, uh, to be faithful during this situation. And that's been hard. And I, I know that I don't talk about that a lot. I don't tend to preach about um, COVID or government regulations or how the church responds. Um, and I think that's in part because of uh, the desire to kind of preach Christ uh, during this time. But I think it's probably also fair to say that it's in part because I'm, I'm new to fellowship and I understand that it's a sensitive topic and, um, and yeah, the new pastor doesn't want to be the one to stir up controversy. And so I actually had an entirely different message uh, prepared this week. Um, but yesterday as I was reading through the passage, I, I, just, I just became so convicted that this is a passage that, that really speaks into the challenges uh, of our situation and really the challenges of this this past year. Now I recognize that there are obvious differences between the context then and uh, the context today, but I think there are also some unavoidable parallels when you look at the story of Exodus. You know, for example, back then and also uh, today, you have a picture of God's people who are going through kind of a, a prolonged uh, season a, a of hardship, a prolonged season of difficulty. Uh, both back then and also today, you have, you have a season where uh, God's people are, are struggling to make sense of, of God's plan. I think back then and, and also today, you have God's people who are, who are longing to do this, who are, who are longing to be able to freely uh, gather for worship. And both back then and today, you, you have a, a governing authority or you have a figure who is forbidding them from doing so. Whatever, whatever the differences might be, I think we have to acknowledge that those, those basic facts still remain the same. And so, so what I want to do this morning as I open up God's word is I, I, I want to speak to you somewhat personally, um, kind of from my heart as, as a pastor to you, and I guess to our neighborhood or wh whoever is listening. Um, but I, I want to use this time to kind of reflect on the past year and to think about how we as individuals, but also uh, as a church, have maybe carried ourselves. And I want to break it apart into kind of just two parts. I want to consider uh, our reaction, and then also to consider God's response. So our reaction, and then God's response. Uh, for those of you who might not have been with us uh, two weeks ago, let me, let me just give you a super quick refresher to kind of get you up to speed. Uh, when we left off in our text, we had Moses and Aaron, and they had finally come to Egypt. They'd received instruction from God, and they'd come, and they'd gathered the people. They'd gathered the elders, 
uh, together. They've gathered the leaders, probably uh, the foremen of, of the people. They gather all the people together, and they, and they tell them about God's plan. They say, listen, God has, uh, God has heard your cries. God has, has seen your suffering. And God has, has had compassion on you. God, God has sent us on his behalf in order to, to save you, in order to lead you up out of slavery in Egypt and to take you to a promised land. They, 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 they go, guys, it, it is, this is going to be good. But they also say it, it, it's going to be hard. And the reason why is because Pharaoh is going Pharaoh's to harden his heart. Pharaoh, Pharaoh's not going to do this wi- willingly. In, in, in chapter 3, verse 19, God tells Moses, that, that he's going to have to compel him. He's going he's to have to force him w- 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 with a mighty hand. But the people of Israel, if we look at the end of chapter 4, it, it seems like they kind of uh, seem to kind of gloss over the bad news and they kind of lock on to the good news. Right? They, they, they rejoice. They bow down and worship. They hear that they're going to be free, that they're going to have a promised land. And they're excited. But then Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh. And suddenly things don't, don't go according to plan. Well, at least not according to their plan. Right? Pharaoh, Pharaoh doesn't say yes. In fact, Pharaoh says no. And not only does he say no, he makes life harder on the people. He adds additional burdens to them. He says, well, not only are you going to have to make bricks, but now you have to make them without straw. I'm not going to provide you straw. You, you get your own. And so life is heavy. Life, life is hard on the people. And it's not exactly clear from our text today, but if you look at the words of, of Moses a little bit later on, I think in verse 24, it, it, it's clear that, that time has passed. And we get the sense that a significant amount of time has passed and nothing has changed. Life seems to go from bad to worse, and the people are starting to wrestle. They're starting to deal with, with doubt. Well, as we get into our text in verse 15, we find the Israelite foreman, and they are on their way to see Pharaoh. These foremen, you'd have to imagine that they are kind of like supervisors that have been appointed, uh, they, they've been appointed by the Egyptians. They're Israelites, and they have the responsibility to make sure that kind of their group of people, that, uh, that, that, that their crew manages to provide the the amount of 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 daily bricks that they manage to meet kind of the quota of daily bricks each day that responsibility falls to them and if the people don't produce they're the ones who get beaten it's obvious from our text that they've just received another thorough thrashing at the hands of the egyptians and they're on their way to plead their case with pharaoh and so they come into pharaoh's presence and they say Pharaoh, why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. Now, I don't think that the Israelite foremen here are being confrontational. I think they're actually trying to be faithful. Do you notice that that three times, just in these verses, three times they refer to themselves as Pharaoh's servants. They're trying to be faithful servants, but they kind of feel torn because they're watching their their own people, they're watching their fellow Israelites struggle under the burden of having to try to, to build brick without straw. And they're encouraging them to do their best, and, and, and they're encouraging them to go and to gather straw and to, and to meet the daily quota. But it's as if Pharaoh is asking the impossible of them. And so they really feel that, that this tension. They want to be faithful servants, but they're kind of just pushed to the breaking point. And as I reflect on this text, I can't help but have some sympathy for the Israelite foreman. Again, if I'm just speaking personally to you this morning, I, I have felt somewhat torn over the past year. I think on the one hand, you know, I've wanted to, to honor the governing authorities and to do the things that they've asked. But at the same time, I've also, I've also seen the, the tremendous burden 
that this has been on, on God's people. I've seen the burden of those who've lost loved ones. I've also seen the burden of those who've had to live in isolation. I see the burden of elderly people who are not able to experience the companionship and the touch of a loved one. Or you see the burden of people who are trying to, to keep their livelihood afloat. You see the burden of uh, parents. I've enjoyed the burden of a parent who's trying to manage work uh, while also teaching at home. And I think as this has stretched on and on and on, the reality is that you watch people kind of hit a breaking point. And I think the truth is that even for myself, I've hit a breaking point. Um, you probably know that I was given last week, I was given the week off by council, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, but I, I think the truth is that part, the major reason why was because I just simply hit a stage where I, I could not I could not bring myself to preach to a camera again. And I know that that seems maybe surprising from your side. Um, because from your perspective, you're able to watch, and thanks to our wonderful AV tech, they, they nicely put together a video, and everything is neatly put together. But I, I, I have to say that from my perspective, as, as a pastor, um, trying to preach to an empty church feels somewhat like trying to build bricks without straw. It's, an, it's just an incredible burden that's weighed on my heart. And so I have some sympathy for these Israelite foremen, and I, I, think, I think on some level we probably all do. I think we, we get pushed sometimes just by life and by hardships. You get pushed and pushed to a breaking point where you almost feel like you can't do it anymore. Well, these Israelite foremen, they receive no sympathy from Pharaoh. That much is sure. He tells them that they are lazy. He tells them that they need to get back to work. And so the foreman, they, they leave the presence of, of Pharaoh, and we're told that Aaron and Moses are, are waiting for them. Now, we don't know exactly why Aaron and Moses don't go inside. Uh, probably my best guess would be that they weren't exactly very popular with Pharaoh at that point. Right, so Moses and Aaron are waiting outside, and when the Israelite foreman see them, th they just lash out. They, they turn on them, and th the word in the Hebrew is a word that is not, it, it's, it almost describes an attack. They, 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 they launch this personal attack. They say, the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and you have put a sword in their hands to kill us. Suddenly, these foremen, they just, they just turn and attack Moses and Aaron. And what's interesting is that they forget that they're actually on the same team. They're brothers. They're fellow Israelites. They're part of the people of God. They are on the same journey collectively to the promised land. And I think what's happened is that they knew that God had, had, had warned them that it would be hard, but they just didn't think it would be this hard. And so when they get pushed and pushed and pushed, and when they reach that, that, that breaking point, they react by lashing out. They react by kind of attacking one another. And I think, as I reflect on the past year, I think we have to be honest and say that we have seen a lot of this. We've seen a lot of, of Christians turning against one another. A couple of weeks ago, I had an opportunity to, uh, to sit down. Uh, I, met, I met a pastor who I've known from some years ago. Uh, this pastor is someone who has chosen not to close his church during the past year. Um, I want to say that he, he is a brother in Christ. Uh, he's someone who loves the church, who loves God's word. He loves the Lord Jesus. He was humble. He was gracious. And yet he holds the position. He's passionately convicted that the church should remain open. And we talked for a couple of hours. We, 
debated various things and various biblical passages, and we don't see eye to eye on everything. But it was interesting that we shared a common concern, a common concern about how Christians on both sides of the debate, how they have turned on each other and how they've launched often personal attacks against each other. And I, I think this passage should serve as a warning for us. A, a warning that the devil takes these times, these times of hardship and these trials, and, and he uses them to tempt us and to draw us to this place where we begin to actually turn on one another and attack one another. I think one of the burdens on my heart is how destructive this past year has been on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, I've never been a big social media guy. I think you know that about me. Um, but in the past year, I've abandoned it almost altogether. Because I just, I cannot stomach, I can't look and read the things uh, that Christians are writing and saying about one another. I can't help but think, may God forgive us. May God forgive us. And before we do this, because I know I'm inclined to do it, and we're all inclined to do this, before we immediately think of the person that pops to mind who should probably hear this news, I, I just want to say, think about your reaction. In the past year, have you reflected the character of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you, have you reflected his kindness? Have you spoken the truth? But have you done so in love? Have you, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 3, have you been eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace? We have one last reaction this morning, and it is that of Moses. Moses, we're told in verse 22, that after the Israelite form and turn on him and, and kind of launch this personal attack, we're told that Moses turns to the Lord. And it's a picture of Moses basically taking uh, th 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 this burden that he's carrying and he's, and he's bringing it to the Lord in prayer. And this is what he says. He says, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Moses cannot fathom God's plan. Moses doesn't understand this at all. He says, God, I've been faithful. I've, I've done exactly what you have told me to do. I, I, I've tried, I've worked, I've been faithful, I've been diligent, I've done the things. I've laid it on the line for you, God. I've done my part, but you, you are not doing yours. And I think in Moses, you actually, what you have is a picture, really, of the disciples of Jesus. Moses says, God, I, 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 I've done exactly what you said. I've been faithful, and yet now here I am in this horrific storm. I'm in this time of incredible hardship. And God, you seem like you're asleep at the wheel. God, don't you care? God, don't, don't you see? Aren't you watching what's happening to us? Moses forgets that even faithful disciples encounter storms. And the question God is after in his life is the question, Moses, who will you trust in the storm? As I look at this past year, I have to acknowledge that things have not gone according to plan. Certainly not according to my plan when I accepted the call uh, to serve here at fellowship. I can tell you that much. And what's happened is that through my reaction, I've often become frustrated about the way that things unfold. And that's led to times where you're angry and times where you, where you kind of lash out at other people. Times where you actually kind of look at God and you're like, God, like, hey, I'm, I'm doing exactly what you've called me to do. And you, know, you don't seem to be doing your part. So often our reaction is, is very different from that of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of Jesus who came to earth and said, yet not my will, but your will be done, Lord. God, let me live not according to, to my plan, but let me live according to your plan. I, I think of Jesus serving as our representative, as, as the one who came to earth 
who saw our, our suffering, who saw that we were unable to produce the righteousness that God required, and he said, that's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll provide what you cannot. I, I, I think of Jesus saying, I will take the punishment that you deserve. I think of, of actually, when I think of this passage, I can't help but think of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. This picture of, of, of the one who is perfectly innocent being savagely beaten and flogged on behalf of the guilty. And yet instead of saying to, to Pharaoh, like, uh, you know, you're being unfair, instead of kind of launching and defending his case, we're told that he was silent. I think of Jesus hanging on the cross when he looks down on those people, the very ones, people like you and I who caused his suffering, and, and instead, instead of turning on them and attacking them, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I think of Jesus in those dying moments when, when he's about to enter into the eye of the storm against God's wrath. He, he doesn't doubt, but he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And I think that's the picture of someone that we can trust to lead us through the storm. And we need to remember that. Because often we're like Peter, trying to walk on the water. And what we do is we start to look at the wind and we start to look at the waves and we start to look at ourselves when in reality we should be fixing our eyes on Jesus. We so often from week to week need to be reminded of the good news. And that's really how, how God responds to Moses in this passage Right? Moses is saying to God, God, I've done everything you've asked. I've done it, God. I've, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried, but nothing's working. Nothing seems to change. I'm doing my best and it's not working. And God says, exactly. God says, now you're ready for the lesson. Notice verse 1. God says to him, now you will see what I will do. I love the quote by Billy Graham when he says, when we come to the end of ourselves, we come to the beginning of God. When you look at this story, whether it's the Israelite foreman, whether it's Moses, whether it's Aaron, the basic problem remains the same. They've heard the plan of God. They've, they've heard the promises of God. They've heard of the things that God will do about how he's going to free them and, and lead them on their way to a promised land. And they think it's amazing. But then suddenly they kind of shift into this mode where they think that they need to accomplish the plan. And so they go out and they try to be faithful and they try to, to kind of lead their best lives and to do the things that God has asked them to do. And then suddenly something doesn't go according to plan. At least not their plan. They go, oh, okay, well that, that's, that's problematic. Okay, I probably got to work harder. So they work harder and harder and harder and harder. And nothing seems to change. And they become angry and they become bitter and they lash out and they have questions about God. And I think many Christians fall into this trap. Many of us, uh, we, we, we live this way or we fall back into living this way. We'll be here and we'll hear the good news and we'll go, wow, that's amazing. God's got these promises and this plan where he's going to free us from our, our burden, from slavery to sin. And he's going to lead us ultimately to, to a home, to an eternal home. And then we leave and somehow we flip into this mode where we think that, that we actually need to, to be the ones to accomplish that plan. And we go out, we, we start trying to be faithful, we try to do all the Christian things, kind of to, to lead the life because obviously it's dependent on us. And then something doesn't go according to plan. We go, okay, well that's frustrating. Okay, I better, I better like be a little bit more faithful, work a little bit harder, maybe pray a bit more, church a bit more, Bible do a little bit more, and nothing seems to change. And the longer that things don't go according to our plan, the more frustrated we become and the more angry that we become and, and, and the more that we begin to kind of launch these questions against God. And we say, God, don't you see us? God, don't you care about the things that are happening to us? We forget that, that it's often in in bringing us to the end of ourselves 
that God brings us to really the beginning of a life that's dependent on him. I don't know if any of you know the story of Johnny Erickson Tata. She's fairly well known. Her story's fairly well known. She was a, a woman who was born in 1949 in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, she grew up in a, in a Christian home, I believe. She, she embraced Christ as her Savior from, from quite a young age. And she describes herself as someone um, who really didn't get into a whole lot of trouble. She, w- she was quite a good kid. And she was quite committed to following Jesus. But in the later years of her high school life, things kind of began to wander a little bit. And she said her, her devotion to Christ and her, her love for God kind of began to wane. And so she prayed to God, especially in her high school year, because she didn't want to go to college and kind of profane the name of Christ. She didn't, she didn't want to bring dishonor on the name of Christ. So, so what she did is um, she, she, she came to the Lord in prayer and she said, God, God, I want you to move in my life. God, I want you to draw me closer to yourself. Well, two weeks after her high school graduation, she was with her family, and she didn't know it, but she dove into the shallow waters of Chesapeake Bay. Her head hit the bottom, her neck twisted back. And at 17 years old, she was left a quadriplegic. She talks about the anger that she felt in those days and about the massive questions that she had for God. She talks about uh, the, the way in which she, she said to him, she's like, God, you know, I, I, I prayed for you to move in my life. I prayed for you to draw me closer to yourself. How could you possibly allow this to happen? She says it took her a long time to realize that God had answered her prayer. Just not in the way that she had wanted or the way that she had necessarily expected. God had moved in Johnny's life to to bring her to this place where she was both physically and spiritually broken, where she had to say, God, I, I can't do it. And God said, that's okay. Now you will see what I will do. And I think that's the picture that you often get in the Gospels of Jesus. Think of all the stories of Jesus. Think of how many people are flocking to Jesus during the New Testament, and they're coming to him, and often they are physically or spiritually broken, and they fall on their knees before Jesus, and they look to him, and they say, Jesus, I can't do it anymore. And Jesus says, that's okay. Now you will see what I will do. I wonder what your reaction has been to the past year or to the hardship maybe that you've faced in your life. You know, sometimes God has to take us off of our plan in order to teach us to be completely dependent on his. Sometimes God has to bring us to a place where we are completely physically and sometimes spiritually just broken, where we are at the end of ourselves, where we say, I can't do it anymore. And then God says, that's okay. Now you will see what I will do. Let me pray. Father, this morning, as we gather, we do so as broken people. We come here knowing that We are so prone to self-reliance, so prone to depending on ourselves. So often tempted to think that life is about what we can do or that you are somehow dependent on us, that you need us to accomplish your plan. And we lose sight of the fact that your call is simply for us to trust you and your plan, wherever that plan might lead. And we know how incredibly hard that can be. We know the burdens that we sometimes encounter. We know the hardships that we face. And it can be such a struggle. Sometimes we think, God, don't you see? Don't you care? But help us to realize what we have in Jesus. Father, help us open up our eyes so that we see what you will do. 
and where we also see what you have done. That we would marvel at our Savior and say, who is this that can calm the wind and the sea? That we would fall to our knees and say, who is this that can forgive sins? Who is this that can restore and heal and redeem? Open up our eyes. Bring us to praise. Help us to love you and help us to love our Savior Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.